Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining Mobility Field Day uh, with MIST. As Jeff said, this is where we were born. The, you are part of family. If you are a delegate today, if you are on the, uh, uh, the live stream on, uh, or, or, or watching on Twitter, um, uh, truly, uh, every one of you, you've helped us become who we are. A hundred and fifty thousand AP customer, a single customer, we couldn't get there without the help of the entire uh, you know, mobility community. Uh, thank you for making miss who we are today. This is family for us. And the second thing I'm gonna lead off with is um, you have us to blame for all this AI ML washing uh, uh, everywhere, every presenter, ev everything that happens because we started it. And so I apologize. I know, you know, every damn slide, you know, is like AI enough and ML over. Uh, but, um, you know, truly it's been a journey for us. And it's been a journey because, again, Bob, our CTO and co-founder of MIST, it's been his vision that we are executing on and we're continuing to double down on. What we want to do is show you the same slide we showed you the last five mobility field days that we participated in uh, and start with where are we on our journey. Without further ado, Bob, I'm going to ask you to uh, take away uh, sort of our first slide. Uh, anyway, thank you, Sadir. You know, as Sadir, echoing Sadir, you know, Mobile Field Day has been part of the MIST journey since we began. You know, when Sujay and I started MIST six years ago, we've been on this journey to really build a solution that can answer and manage networks on par with domain experts. And, you know, and that journey really started with the framework we've been presenting for the last five years. And what I like to talk to you today is data. You know, as we all know, data has been the source of AI ML. You know, for those who know me, I make a barrel of wine every year. You know, as I always say, good wine starts with good grapes, good AI starts with good data. And what we're going to be seeing this year is really how we've expanded from answering the question of going client to cloud. We started that journey with the access point, right? Because the access point had the data we needed to answer the question, why are you having poor internet connectivity? You know, what you're seeing us do now is really extend that across the Juniper portfolio, switches and routers which really lets Marvis answers more questions. You know, as we add the router into the Marvis, we start to answer questions about apps and services. Why is your Zoom having a bad experience? And we start to be able to answer questions with more granularity. And what you're going to see this year is we're starting to bring the client's view into the network. We're starting to bring with our Marvis SDK, how does the client view the network, which really starts to help us start to answer roaming questions with more granularity. You know, the other key part of the journey has always been the framework and the data science piece of the puzzle. And what we're going to see a little bit this year and hear Jinxing talk about is how we started with the SLE framework. We're starting to extend that into graph databases now. And what that graph database brings is really the topology of the network, that client to cloud experience. So now we're starting to track all the different network elements between that client and the cloud. And we're starting to be able to do things like temporal correlation and starting to be able to correlate you know, when you misconfigure that router that screws up your client uh, authentication, those needle in the haystack problems, Marvis is able to start to dig out. And then the third component, you know, and this has been another passion of mine, is really around conversational interfaces. You know, we all saw over the last 20 years how we kind of moved from that CLI paradigm into the dashboard. You know, what we're seeing now is we're going to be giving, seeing dashboards give way to conversational interfaces. These networks are getting so complex, hundreds of dashboards are more than the average IT person can take care of. Conversational interfaces are going to be the new interface into helping IT get to the data, get to the problem they're trying to solve. And finally, it all comes to that self-driving piece. And that's what you're going to see the team talked about today is those actions, you know, how we're starting to turn those actions into low false positive events, right? We're starting to get to the point where we can now do anomaly detections that are worth listening to. Yeah, let's dive into this, Bob. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to take our five pillars and we're going to focus on what is new. What have we done differently uh, since uh, we've started this journey? And obviously, as Bob said, if for us, it all starts with data, right? Why 
uh, you know, why are we so fundamentally different? Um, you know, uh, today, you know, if you haven't tried MIST, you should, because if you if we go into a POC, we almost always win. And, and the fundamental difference starts from, we started with a clean sheet of paper, wrote the AP code and the cloud code, completely, you know, ground up. And that gave us an ability to actually architect the access point software for a cloud native system, right? Just stream as much data as you want into the cloud and all that good stuff. So without any agents, without any, uh, um, you know, presence on the client, we have incredible data in the MIST cloud that helps you do everything that we are doing. However, the, in some scenarios, we actually felt like, okay, maybe you can add a, a client. Exactly. And a lot of our competitors, you know, they, they do sensors that are alien to the actual system you're using. We do not believe in that 100% uh, uh, that we absolutely have no uh, belief in doing that. So what we are doing is for some of our verticals, this doesn't apply to all our verticals, for retail, for logistics, for healthcare, where you actually control the ecosystem a lot better um, uh, for your own devices, there is an opportunity to add a, a client SDK that gives you even more richer data. Yes, this doesn't apply to health, higher education, K-12, some of the enterprises, but for the, where it does apply, it's game changing. So Bob, let's talk a little bit about Marvis SDK, Marvis client, and then we'll show what is the first new announcement of the day. Right now with Marvis SDK, and as Sudhir mentioned, we're starting to see more of our customers move to apps, whether it's a retail customer, a school customer, more and more people are deploying apps to the customers. And what this really allows us to do is do the synthetic testing, right? This brings in that client view into the network because we all know that you know, one third of our problems are due to clients. Something on the client is causing a problem on the network. And what this client view really brings it to, especially in roaming, you know, when we start to be able to bring in that view in the network, we're able to start to watch that slow roaming, right? That sticky roaming problem. When people start to see asymmetry, right? We know the view of the client from the access point. Now we know the view of the client from itself. So if there's any asymmetry in the antennas and the RSS site, that starts to come out in the SDK. So this is back to that theme of, as we start to add more data into Marvis, we're starting to answer more questions with granularity. Now we know you're having a connectivity problem or a poor internet experience. Now we can go into the client and start to understand, is that due to some sort of version on the client? You know, is it due to a poor device, uh, roaming device down there? So this is what's critical on bringing Marvis that next level of step and adding more granularity. You know, with that, I'm going to turn it back to Sadir, who's going to basically bring us into like our first demo of where we're actually applying SDK into one of our partners. Yeah, so the first partner we're, we're launching this with is uh, with Zebra. So again, if you're retail logistics, one of our retail customers has 300,000 Zebra handhelds, right? Imagine getting rich data from those devices natively into the MIST dashboard. So what does that look like, right? What that looks like is, is essentially if, if once you have Marvis SDK, and this is a beginning, right? This is the first partner we're launching with. This is, a, this is an SDK that's available for uh, many other partners. Now, not just AP reported events, but client reported events natively in the MIST dashboard. The client uh, data is streaming into the MIST cloud, um, you know, whether it's disconnections, whether it's DHCP, um, uh, whether it's, you know, voice quality, whatever it is, the idea is get the client perspective, but not an alien client that is not your production user, the actual user clients that are actually passing data on your network, those clients get their perspective into the MIST cloud. And so, you know, as an example, I mean, uh, a lot of these Zebra handhelds uh, support voice. And so getting the voice metrics into the system natively for sort of every call that is happening from that system, right? Being able to understand sort of the roaming metrics as Bob was just talking about, right? This is powerful. And then also one of the very interesting side advantages of this is, is RSSI is just plain old how does the client hear the AP um, uh, from the client's own perspective, being able to stream that, understanding, hey, what de device driver version am I operating with? Because at, at an estate of 100,000, 
a thousand, a hundred handheld devices. If you have several different variants of this, you, you struggle. Last but not least, the cherry on top is a voice SLE um, for specifically with a, with a Marvis SDK is being able to stream that and bring a new SLE for uh, these handheld devices. Again, um, not, not applicable to most of our customers uh, in terms of higher ed and, and all these places, but the, 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 the retail vertical, the logistics vertical, the healthcare vertical, where there's a lot of uh, these handhelds out there, this is phenomenally useful. That is step one. Now, after this, uh, let's talk about service levels, right? We talked about the first pillar data. The second pillar is, uh, is service levels. So service levels, uh, we've started with Wi-Fi. You know, we started with, are you able to connect? And, you know, how is your experience on the network? We continue to double down on Wi-Fi. And, and I'm going to show you some of the advances we've made. But everything we're going to talk about today is about spanning the network with this entire architecture, right? So, so service levels on the wired side, on the van side, the entire thing we're going to demo today. The first service level that truly for us, uh, we are excited about is, um, is, is this brand new service level around successful connects. This is version 2.0 of it. And so let's talk about first, what did we do differently since last Mobility Field Day on successful connects? Jixing, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to take a step with this. Yeah, thanks to you. So, you know, as you know, when we troubleshoot the client, client connectivity issues, most of the time we just focus on the initial pre-connection, you know, when client uh, joins the network or roams inside the network. But as you all know, any of the post-connection issues like a DNS failure or gateway timeout will also cause some severe user connectivity problem. So in this new successful connect improvement work, as Sudhir mentioned, we have really extended our client state machine to cover the full session lifecycle for all of the active wireless and wired clients. So what does that mean? Actually, we are maintaining and updating the per client state machine for over millions of the active users simultaneously in our cloud by processing almost 1 billion client events every day. This is a skill you cannot do at any of the legacy or controller-based architecture. And this is truly a strong endorsement of this uh, elasticity of the cloud native architecture MIST has built you know, at the beginning. Awesome. So let's actually quickly look at it um, uh, in, in sort of a, in terms of a sort of a real world application of this. What we find is, you know, um, obviously Wi-Fi issues, you know, radius or the or pre shared key issues, but in a life cycle, what can the length of a session be? Right? Historically, you know, sessions were okay. I got a, I got an IP address. I'm on. Uh, uh, basically, uh, I, I'm ready to roll. I'm passing traffic. But after that, you know, there's there's you know, you're doing ARPs, you're doing DNSs, you're doing uh, uh, you know, DHCP renews and all this kind of stuff. A session can last you know hours and days and and weeks uh, uh, and and months if you are a wired user, right? Nothing really changes, you sit there, but we are continuing to actually make sure that entire session experience is, uh, is, is collated and curated, right? So this, this, is, this is live, this is available, all of our customers, it is launched, it's part of the MIST dashboard um, right now. The next one, this is truly a brand new upgrade uh, to our uh, roaming SLE. None of our customers have seen this. This is the first viewing at Mobility Field Day. So Wes, I'm gonna ask you to speak to what have we done with uh, roaming? Yeah, so if you're, uh, if you're familiar with Mist, you know that we have a roaming SLE today. Uh, it is, uh, it, it's a time-based measure, right? It, uh, every single roam, that a client does, we keep track of how long is it taking you to roam? And we kind of bucketize that to clients that are fast roaming capable, whether they do, uh, you know, OKC or 11R, um, if they're not, if they're not fast roam capable. Um, and, and this is what, you know, this is what we've had um, for a number of years. And uh, it, it is valuable. 
Um, but we're enhancing this uh, with Roaming SLE version 2.0, um, which uh, is adding the, you know, the quality of the roam, right? So there's, um, we've, we've um, reorganized the classifiers a little bit and added this uh, signal quality bucket. Uh, and so if you click on signal quality, uh, there are two classifiers in there at the moment. One is suboptimal roam, uh, the other is sticky client. And uh, these look at, so when the client has roamed, so suboptimal roam, is the client is not roaming, right? They're, they're connected to an AP with poor signal strength uh, when we know there's a better AP for the client to connect to. And that's how it gets uh, classified as suboptimal roam. And sticky client um, uh, is, uh, sorry, that is that is sticky client. Um, and <laughs> uh, suboptimal roam uh, is when the client is actually um, roamed to an AP with weaker signal strength. Um, and and uh, uh, it is, you know, it's roamed uh, with weaker, weaker signal strength uh, and it's a poor signal strength roam. Uh, so, you know, both of those must be met. Uh, and so this kind of, this quality measure uh, is really um, foundational to things that we're going to do in the future. So if, if you know, the, the, the SLEs feed into Marvists um, and roaming Lee, uh, version 2.0 will, no, will be no different. Um, and so this is really laying, laying the groundwork um, and really being able to grade every single client roam that you have on your network to know if it's a good roam, if it's a bad roam, uh, if you have uh, you know scenarios where clients are sticking, um, uh, uh, or if you know suboptimal roams, and you'll see things like interband roaming. Um, it's just a this is a a an SLE that we're has been a long time coming, and I think something that uh, uh, we're very very excited about. When you say that it's a suboptimal roam, are you talking that it hasn't roamed to the best signal strength AP? Uh, it is. It is roaming to. Uh, it is roaming to an AP with weaker signal strength. Right. So and it's it, it's and it already it's has. not necessarily you know, right. Exactly. Right. It's it's at a it's at a point where uh, the signal strength is you know either you know at you know it's at an adequate level. And then it roams to a weaker signal strength, right? So if it roams like weak signal strength, weak signal strength, we don't care, necessarily care about that. But if it was at a good signal strength already, and then it roamed to a weaker uh, AP, that's what we care about. Hey Wes, I, I look at these types of problems, and I want, and I wonder how many of these are, uh, how many of these the actual root cause is poor Wi-Fi design. I've asked, I think, at every mobility field day, what is Juniper and Mist recommendation for doing enterprise Wi-Fi design, and I've been told every single time that that is a good, important question that needs to be addressed and will be addressed soon. But we mm -hmm. still have no Mist or Juniper enterprise Wi-Fi design guide. Um, yep, is that yep. something you guys are just yep. going to forego and just throw out the window and, 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 and never do? I mean, it, it, it's, it's sort of telling that, that these appear to be Wi-Fi design problems and you're distilling all that up, but you're not addressing the root of the problem, which is people designing Wi-Fi poorly. Yeah, sure. Sure. That's fair. Um, last year we told you to wait, uh, you know, give us, give us a little while. We'll come back to you, uh, this year, if you can wait maybe 15 or 20 minutes, uh, we'll, we'll talk through that. So I'm looking at this, I see what's going on. Now what? You know, to Sam's point, maybe it's a bad design, but maybe it's, you know, a hundred other things. So, you know, what's the what's the goal other than knowing the cause? You know what I mean? What do you do about this? I was also going to introduce Jacob. Uh, Jacob, uh, we've designed this for some very interesting customer examples. Wes, I'm going to let you first answer since the question was asked for you, and then I'll have, have Jacob chime in as well on sort of sort of the, some of the real world applications of what do you do with this, right? You know, now that you know. So Wes, maybe you take a stab, or if you want to punt to Jacob, happy to. Yeah, I'll just do a quick one and hand it over to Jacob. Um, so it's you know the first. Uh, the first thing to, to know is, is, is to know, right? You have to know that there's a problem. Uh, and so this is, you know, we're just showing the high level here, but you, you know, you, you'll break this out and be able, you, you can next, you know, uh, so if you click on like suboptimal roam, it'll, it'll actually tell you which clients are experiencing uh, suboptimal roams, uh, which APs. Um, and so you're able to kind of categorize and understand the scope of the issue. Um, and, you know, the, the SLE as it stands today, um, yeah, there's it kind of it kind of paints a picture for you that you you know that you have to finish. Um, but where it will head with uh, you know feeding into Marvis is um, 
you know, the ability to remediate, um, whether if, if there's possibility to remediate from the infrastructure side, uh, that will, you know, whether it's, whether it's a, um, you know, a, a RRM change, whether it's a, um, you know, you know, a sticky client kind of, uh, you know, let's, let's nudge the AP. Um, that's where this is heading. Um, but, you know, this is, this is, you know, the visibility standpoint. Are you guys trying to do any correlation with location? Because sometimes when we have like, you know, poor rooming experience, it's always at the same place in the warehouse or whatnot. Uh, so are you guys you thinking of that? Too, so if you click on roaming v2 uh, and then go to location yeah so so oh, okay, um yes absolutely the, the this map view is super useful <laughs> uh, and very important for understanding uh where your poor roams are occurring jacob 30 seconds quick uh, customer examples sure um um like like west just alluded to right i mean um uh, we, we really want to identify the root cause and the blast radius uh, of, of the problem there are a lot of times when, uh, when, when customers are trying to troubleshoot, right? I mean, uh, you, are, you are trying to troubleshoot a poor RF experience. And if, if that is due to poor coverage, poor signal, is that something that is caused by a bad roam? Or is that something that is you know, happening always, right? So the, the end of the day, if the clients make the right AP choice, then the job is half done. And this SLE will give you that answer. If, it, if the client is actually making the right choice, is it roaming too fast? Is it roaming too soon? Is it making too many roams? And is there a correlation to client? Is there a correlation to AP? Is there something that is uh, you know, bubbling up at a site level? So all those answers, you are actually getting answered as part of this SLE. And most importantly, this is going to enhance some of uh, our um, self-driving features that we have in our RRM. So RRM decision making is directly getting reinforced as part of uh, this SLE feedback loop. And also um, there's one more Marvis action that we'll be talking about later in the presentation. That action will again get enhanced with the data coming in from this SLE. Do you guys exclude cases where the clients at the end of the footprint coverage, like, you know, sub optimum, you know, roaming is the only option anyway. So do you guys exclude or include those uh, cases? Very good question. Uh, we, we, we have uh, taken special uh, care of that particular scenario that you said. We call that the fringe AP or the fringe coverage zone scenario. Um, one of the reasons why uh, you know, we, we, we took a long time to get this SLE out was to make sure we don't, we don't end up um, you know, uh, giving you data that you cannot act upon. So the fringe AP scenarios, you're trying to, um, you know, clients trying to latch onto an AP with no other choices available all those um, scenarios would um, are taken into account. So we don't flag those as suboptimal. I get some, a lot of roaming issues, um, at least in my experience, are often client related. Um, so there's a particular device type that's um, struggling to roam. So I'm guessing, um, or I'm hoping this can tell you that, you know, you've got a maybe a particular device type you own that is actually causing the problem um, that you might need to look at doing updates on. Is that true? Yeah, Peter, good question. So as the SLE framework already gives you that, um, uh, that, that kind of correlation. So device OS, device type, um, you know, is there a correlation to AP? Um, and, and so that if you can actually click on uh, a particular client, uh, then from a client's perspective, you can actually see what is the failure likelihood of that particular client, you know, uh, you know uh, experiencing bad roaming. So if you, if you click on the correlation tab, Sudhi, so you, can actually, a, you can actually see here the failure likelihood, and uh, if the likelihood is due to an OS type, is like the likelihood is due to a device type that is already accounted by the model. So I had a quick question, if I may. Obviously, this is creating a lot of excitement, but. Um, I, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, well, this would be a nice way of benchmarking your system and having measurements or goals validating that you've got a good design as part of this. But I'm also a bit concerned about how this interrelates with some of the um, automatic algorithms for configuring the network, like power control, dynamic frequency selection, and particularly load balancing, because um, I could see load balancing forcing some of these decisions. Have you thought about how you interwork this with some of those automated algorithms? Uh, great question and great thoughts. Absolutely. Uh, this is, I would call it, uh, this is the first building block towards some of those automated self-driving 
uh, uh, I wouldn't call it optimizations, I would say self-driving uh, actions that the system can take. Um, load balancing is a good example. Um, you know, there are cases where you could actually, um, you know, uh, help the clients make good choices by, by, you know, by, by making subtle adjustments to the network. Your other uh, question around baselining, yes, we can actually use this SLE to kind of baseline your, your install or any other configuration change that you did to optimize. So, um, so absolutely, this will serve as a building block towards those actions. And then to, to be honest, today, um, RRM is our proudest uh, uh, feature. Uh, almost 100% of our networks deploy with this. Uh, it's, it's truly, you know, with reinforcement learning and some of the AI feedback loop, we use a lot of this already in the system. So uh, we were taking bets on where we would get stuck in the presentation and the, and the popular bet was this slide. So, uh, um, but uh, let me just introduce actually Jacob Thomas as well. Jacob is our chief architect. Uh, he is the brains behind the operation of the entire MIST dashboard, runs uh, uh, with our customers, our largest customers. Uh, you know, one of our customers is not the largest one, the second largest one, 110,000 APs. They have incredibly large robotic sites where this thing originated from, right? Um, uh, they, those robots, tens of thousands of robots in any given facility are actually uh, roaming, you know, five, seven, 10 APs at any given time. Being able to support that and then knowing where to go fix something uh, if, if those things have challenges is, is this, this was born at customers in very large uh, deployments. So um, let, let's keep going. I'm going to speed through some of this. Um, so wire assurance is basically our SLEs for wired. Uh, all we have done uh, net new to this is we've actually brought a org level view. Everell, to your point is, is I just want to know across my entire organization, how is my how are my switches doing? How is successful connects on the switching side for the wired users? Are they able to get DHCP? Are they able to break through uh, port authentication? And, and you know, how is that entire network working? Um, this is our actual corporate enough enterprise and i will tell you our sunnyvale headquarters um you know this, this um today is our first back to work day uh july 15th uh we're using missed contact tracing to come back to work so you'll see a lot more people there but um anyway um the uh this percentage was in like you know in the low uh, 20s right so when we first launched this feature and they found out so many devices that didn't belong on the network that either belonged on the network were not authenticating properly not getting ip whatever it is with wired assurance across a full system view you can see across 50000 ethernet ports that we have deployed globally this is the this is the health of the network it's pretty good right so wired assurance uh, continues to evolve the next sure. Yep. Shadir, very quick question. Is anything that we've seen so far a new license or anything? Um, so, so uh, Lee, um, uh, Wired Assurance is a subscription for switching. Has nothing to do with the wireless, right? So it is, it's just, you know, you, when you buy a switch, uh, uh, you buy a switching subscription, that's Wired Assurance, yeah. So um, it is part of that. Uh, but roaming SLE as an example, part of the base product of MIST, successful connects, part of the base product of MIST. No new subscriptions. So um, the next one is van assurance. This is this is a lot of hard work happening right now, and and I want to just you know in the interest of time probably just do a live demo uh, or versus a video on this. Um, essentially, on van assurance, um, what do you want to know on the van side? Right, first you want to know that the device is doing well. Second, the most important question is, hey. If, if an application is suffering, is it the van link or is it, you know, the van link is healthy and it's the application, right? Literally being able to dissect that conversation and maybe being able to pinpoint that is, is what van assurance is all about, right? And so um, the van link health, you know, how is the network doing upstream again standard you know mist framework you know uh, which gateways which inter interfaces you know which devices are causing issues you know where are um, you know failures happening you know cable issues congestion issues all of this under the van health now where does application health come from application health 
you can determine, you can say, you can pick your applications, um, whatever you want. We will actively probe these applications and say, hey, if you want to uh, go after Teams and Zoom and, and whatever applications you have, you can define as many as you want. And many of them come predefined. And then we basically are looking at, okay, which applications are suffering? And then uh, essentially this, this, this essentially says, if the van link was simultaneously failing, then I wouldn't call that an application issue, right? Because then I know it's the van link and the application couldn't do much with it. But if the van link was healthy and the application was showing latency, jitter, loss, that's what, we're, that's what we want to separate, right? So, so you could see you know, uh, um, some of the applications in, in our office on, on what's going on with them, you know, all, the, all the appropriate metrics for these applications. You can define as many of these applications as you want, and we're actively looking for the health of the app, right? No, no agents required, no configuration on the client required or on the app required, just, just you know, within the network, we're doing this, right? So are this you, is- Can I ask a question? Sorry. So that, are, are you, um, when you're looking at latency and jitter, is that looking at sort of TCP latency or uh, is it at that level or is it actually above that level at application responses? Does it, um, I'm just wondering how you're measuring latency. Awesome, Abhi, I'm gonna to go to the call the expert on this, so, so I don't bullshit people here, so go ahead, please. No, uh, every single um, application that flows through uh, an, an SRX or any of the WAN device, all of them are logged straight to our cloud. We, uh, we seek to see exactly what applications are flowing through and how, and there are two parts to it. One, us talking to uh, the Microsoft Teams, for example, in this case, and also you having to be on a Teams call at the same time. At the same time. We marry these together uh, to bring out saying, when you were having the particular Microsoft Teams call, did you, have to have, uh, did you happen to have a problem? So that in incorporates uh, not, just, uh, uh, not just us seeing that there was, you know, us having reachability problems to Microsoft Teams or uh, uh, you know, the latency towards that, but also you having uh, the the call at the same time. So bringing these together is 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 the result of these affected items in here. Right. So so you're looking at the actual application protocol and and the responses at an application there above TCP. Is, is that right? So it's got that application awareness. It it definitely has application awareness in the sense that it we absolutely know that you uh, every single uh, application that is flowing through is locked to the cloud as a session record that goes all the way to the cloud. Now we also know uh, we, are, we are having latency towards this particular application. We marry these together to bring this about to you. Okay. Maybe just to add here, it's uh, the, we are really application aware. The way we do this, we have uh, you know, different options. Uh, ICMP, HTTP, uh, TCP kind of like uh, uh, props. So, but the, actually the trick here or the most challenging work is how to find this, the actual server, this for the stars application. How do we find the server that the user actually talks to? So there's a learning job like say, uh, Zoom have over 100 server across the world. You know, you probably talk to one of them. How do we find this on a dynamic basis and really probe the same server to really capture the true user experience? I think that is the application level intelligence we build into this. Awesome. So um, can I ask a clarification question? Um, when we look at Teams, Teams is both a user experience when they're interacting in a meeting or whatever, but also Teams is um, recording up in the cloud. And so there's multiple parts of the application that are running. When we look at these figures, are you, are you giving it an overall? Because when you're updating to the cloud and recording to the cloud, you don't really care because it's not part of the user experience. So are you able to split out the application activity to pinpoint the bits that impact the user? 
And, and that's actually what Abi was saying is that we marry a actual Teams call and not a file upload to Teams, right? Okay. Uh, so we, we know that you have a Teams call going on and that's when we actually say, and then the app, the latency loss jitter to the specific server to what Jishing was saying um, is uh, so that it's not to other Teams servers are having slowdown. It's your specific server you're interacting. So it's the actual uh, actual act of having a Zoom call or a Teams call, plus we see latency jitter loss during that time. Uh, this is the third pillar for us. This is our data science toolbox. A lot of times um, there's a lot of AI washing in the industry. And, and to be honest, I think the competitors are doing a, a good enough job of copying missed. So I give them credit uh, for uh, being able to actually do that much. But we started with a, a massive AI toolbox and it continues to evolve. Uh, Bob, maybe uh, just a couple of quick uh, thoughts on this. Yeah, you know, so for me, you know, AI is really the next evolution in automation, right? You know, you look over trying to do with AI, it's really trying to do things on par, automate things on par with humans, you know? And where things are making a difference in the deep learning network is really around this neural net, LSTM. We spent the last year really taking all these pace events we've talked about from the access point. These are basically all the user state events, right? And we're now basically spent the last year building a model that can actually now predict DHCP, ARP, and DNS. And what this is critical from a customer point of view, this starts to handle the use case when there's a DHCP, it looks like a coverage problem from a user's point of view. All they know is they're connected, but they can't move data for some reason, right? So this is kind of that coverage control problem. And you really look in our industry right now, we know these neural networks are making a difference in medical, right? Helping doctors detect cancer, diagnose cancer. You know, we know they're making a difference. This is a case where these neural networks are making a difference in our industry is really around anomaly detection, you know, and you'll see, some demos of where that's where we're leveraging that to really make a difference in in Marvis. The other thing you're seeing this, and I'll let Jin Singh speak a little bit to this, is really around temporal correlation. You know, I mentioned earlier we started the journey with these SLE user experience metrics. That was kind of the heart of, hey, can we actually monitor user experience client to cloud? We're starting to extend that to these graph databases, and this really allows us start to now correlate a user experience with some sort of network event. You know, we had a very particular use case where basically the customer swore that we had a problem in our network because users could not connect. What it turned out to be was what they have done, they misconfigured a router somewhere in the network that they had not realized it happened. And they had no clue that changing the MTU size was going to stop the authentication packets from getting through. You know, so this is a type of, these are the needle in the haystack that drives the IT guys crazy, right? This is where Marvis can now start to find those needles in the haystack quickly when something starts to go wrong. And then finally, the conversational interface, we're really on our second version of it. And we're really, and this is an area that is changing rapidly. If you look what's happening in the natural language space, that's evolving as we speak. And right now, MIST is really doubling down into the conversational interface because we truly believe this is going to be the next way that IT is going to interact with the network. You know, think Star Trek, right? You know, this is the vision of computer, what's wrong uh, type of thing. In Jinxing, I know, you know Jinxing is ahead of our data science. You know, Jinxing, maybe any other comments or where you see us headed yeah. right now, where you got the team focused? Yes, thanks, Bob. I just want to quickly add, maybe I don't want to hijack this meeting as a, you know, really data science uh, uh, meeting, but I just want to, you may saw that from Jeff's slide, we talk about this fifth generation of the Mr. AI. It's not just adding up the numbers. I want to just probably quickly talk like 30 seconds on this involvement of anomaly detection as Bob said. You know, it's really, we continuous working and tuning and evolving them into the fifth generation. If you remember in last year's MFD, we talked about you are creating a site level behavior baseline using a neural network model called the STM. And we are training and updating over 15,000 neural network models simultaneously in the cloud one for each customer site. So this kind of a site specific model give us a very good sensitivity because it has the full knowledge of each site. But sometimes it also causes the, what we call the instability in the model, especially for the small site, right? Because the, the uh, behavior really uh, fluctuates all the time. 
So to compensate that, that's what exactly Bob mentioned, the purpose to compensate that kind of instability in the model, we train another neural network model called this universal, uh, universal client behavior model by combining all of the clients, this millions of the active clients and billions of the data that I talked before into a single model. So now you can see we have this site-specific baseline model plus this universal model. By mixing these two, really have a very good balance between the sensitivity and also the robustness of the model. This gives us a very high accuracy in the detection across all different small, medium, and even large deployments. Uh, deployments. And I think Sudhir will talk about some examples in Marvis Action, uh, Action Section about how we really you know, detect the real world upstream problem, Wi Fi problem, you know, all this user connectivity problems through this anomaly detection. And maybe, and maybe just to emphasize, Jensen, really what he said there this new anomaly detection model is using a global model, using the data globally, and then that model is customized for each site. And so that's very powerful to use the NIST universe to basically build a model that actually can be customized for every site so that's the yeah, other and then now we're really mixing two models to get the best of all the sensitivity and the robustness so you know training the data science is not just to say you know check a box i have neural network it's really like a long journey of, the, of continuous involvement and improvement uh, really on the conversational interface side uh, i just want to quickly fast through maybe a couple of new use cases We've always had a, a conversational interface. Um, 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 you know, we've launched this, this last mobility field day. We've launched it to all our customers, widely used right now. Now we're adding EX and switching into it uh, as part of uh, uh, the, the new launch today. Uh, uh, some of our customers haven't seen um, the switching, uh, uh, you know, troubleshooting and, and triaging and, and conversations uh, through, um, um, uh, you know, through the conversational interface. The next piece that we are launching today is Slack integration. So, uh, so we, because by virtue of having a conversational interface with full 100% API, um, we actually are able to, um, uh, you know, natively integrate into Slack or Teams or, or, or your, uh, you know, tool of choice. And so here, essentially, you can invite Marvis to your Teams call. Uh, um, so uh, basically, the idea is um, you can actually add Marvis to your team. That's the whole point of a Slack bot. Right, you could you could literally have uh, Marvis join your team and triage and troubleshoot with you, and and this is powerful. This is super cool. Uh, this is you know available for API integrations right now uh, to our customers with the Marvis CI integration. So next up is more exciting stuff. We are super stoked. There are some real interesting use cases here um, uh, for Marvis Actions. There is a ton of slides. I'm not going to go through these slides. I'm actually going to show you all in one demo so that uh, we can knock this off all in one shot. So can I can I ask a quick question about the Slack bot? Uh, yes, please, Dan. Is it is it just uh, gathering information from the dashboard, or can you actually get the Slack bot to do things on the network, like turn off SSID, whatever? Um, good question, Dan. Um, so today it is basically being Marvis. So Marvis today, um, uh, you know, gets the data, renders the data, shows you data. Today, it does not support, but that is obviously where we're headed next, right? You know, turn off this AP, you know, upgrade this AP, reboot this AP, whatever it is, you know, um, uh, that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly where we're headed right now. Um, that's not available in the conversation. Press. Great question. Awesome. So, um, Marvis Actions. This is uh, my favorite part. Um, there, there are two pieces to Marvis Actions. There are actions we can take that are intrinsic to the system that, you know, we don't have to wake you up in the middle of the night. And then actions that uh, we can take because it's on the client side, it's on a, um, the, the radius server side, the HCP server side, uh, or a, a non-Juniper switch side, right? So 
let me speed through and talk about some really cool new actions we are launching, right? First one is this persistently failing clients. So uh, as you can imagine, at 150,000 APs as a single network, uh, that, that customer has over a million users connecting. Across a million users, and let's say you filter out all their you know, uh, non-corporate owned devices and take corporate owned, probably about 600,000 devices, simultaneous users. Across 600,000 devices, they wanted to know which of their Zebra handhelds, which of their you know, corporate owned devices just have bad credentials, are persistently hammering the radius server or using a bad PSK and, and, and trying to connect to the network constantly, right? And today there isn't an easy way until Marvis persistently failing clients. So this is new, this is live, this is available for all our customers um, and is part of Marvis. And in, in this example, um, a, another large customer that we have done a public discussion with is MIT. They have about 10 to 12,000 APs uh, with MIST across all of that estate. Um, Wes, how many persistently failing clients did we find? Uh, less than a dozen. Less than a dozen, but finding that dozen in the in the tens of thousands of users that connect is is powerful, right? So this is there. It's it's uh, it's right in the dashboard. I'm going to go AP first and wireless first, and then we'll go through the switch and other stuff. So wireless first. What is brand new? Brand new is coverage hole. Marvis Action. This is just launching. We've tried this at some of our largest deployments around the world. You may say, wait, Cisco Prime 13 years ago had coverage hole detection. Uh, so what are you guys doing here? Right. Uh, uh, welcome to the party. Um, you know, uh, Jacob, I think you were going to take this. So what is coverage hole detection for Marvis? So uh, thank you, Sudhir. So if you look at the coverage SLE, uh, that we have had uh, since day one of MIST. The question that we always get from, um, from, from our customers is, um, what do I do about it? I mean, it is, it is giving me a metric, it is giving me a number. What is good, what is bad? Do I need to take an action? So the coverage whole Marvis action is specifically designed to, to get you that answer. Do I need to do anything from an infrastructure perspective, AP placement, AP augmentation, um, you know, um, maybe, you know, like any, any other fine tuning that you have to do from a network infrastructure standpoint that you need to do to improve your coverage experience. Um, to give you an example, well, one of our largest customers, you know, over 150,000 APs deployed and counting. Um, there is absolutely no way they can actually look at the coverage SLE of all their sites, um, or let alone, you know, um, if there were worse sites and see if they need to act on that, because a lot of it could be just artifacts of client roaming, artifacts of you know, um, you know APs being on the fringe and client connecting to fringe APs. So, if a, if an AP or if a entry shows up in the Marvis coverage hole action, that means you have client impact, and it is not due to fringe APs. It's not due to anything transient. It is persistent, and it is most likely due to a bad design, or most likely due to a bad AP placement or most likely due to an AP that is missing or APs that are missing that needs to be augmented. Thank you, Sudhir. Yeah, so, so this, this, is, this is powerful. It's AI assisted and the difference between what the old school coverage hole and this one, we measure on the client's experience, truly client's experience. And so coverage SLE is built on client, client measurement, if, Every user, every minute, and then uh, you know you bring that across scale. Uh, you know, in in a, in a college campus, uh, again, uh, Wes at the ten thousand plus APs. How many APs did they actually have to either add or change uh, on a on a higher ed campus based on this? I, I think we're at four right now. Four out of ten thousand APs is where they actually go, took action because we determined that the users were actually suffering in those areas, right? So powerful. Uh, while you're there, uh, um, Jacob, insufficient capacity. How is this different? Uh, insufficient capacity. Um, yet another, um, you know, yet another enhancement uh, to our SLE framework. So we have had capacity SLE, which was, I would say, which I would say was one of our most 
actionable SLEs um, all along. And that actually proves as our foundation to our self-driving uh, RRM uh, implementation. So we took the capacity SLE and we, we took it one step further and created this insufficient capacity Marvis action. What this, what this tells you is you, it helps you identify the hotspots on your network. Are there APs or are there zones in your network that are consistently hot where you need to either augment or you need to do some degree of configuration optimization? And Avril, I think you had a suggestion earlier around like load balancing. Are there pockets in your network where load balancing could actually help? How do you, you know, do you need to do it all the time? Do you need to brute force it? Or can that be done based on deep learning? What this, uh, uh, what this Marvis action um, tells us is, we actually do the action on automatically as part of um, our self-driving, whereby if we see hotspots in the network and if we need to make some fine tuning as part of our RM, that is already taken care of. On top of that, if there are actions that the system cannot take automatically, for example, we had a customer, large corporate campus, um, over 700 plus APs, two buildings, multiple floors, um, you know, several thousands of users on a daily basis. They had a floor, a section of a floor where two APs were consistently shot. The, anytime users connect to it, they get a really bad experience. It turned out to be they had two users, they were actually developers, they had um, their desktops hooked up to Wi Fi and they were running a server application which was continuously doing big mass downloads. So any other users within the vicinity were consistently getting impacted. That, that site's capacity SLE was 99% all the time, but there was this one AP that was consistently causing bad user experience to a section of clients in a section of, of, of floor in their large campus. And that, that actually bubbles up in this SLE. So what this, what this action gives you is, if there are hotspots in your network, and if there are things that the infrastructure cannot do on its own, and where a user intervention is needed, it could be a policy thing, it could be a compliance thing, then that will end up showing up. What? How much of what you're talking about here is direct data versus an inference on what the client is seeing? This is all direct data. So uh, insufficient capacity is all um, based on actual utilization data coming in from the APs. Um, and granularly assessed on a per client basis. So if you look at the capacity SLE framework that we have, that is uh, in the utilization data per AP, per radio, uh, per double LAN, per client. So that is, uh, that is aggregated. So we will be able to pinpoint the clients that are actually contributing to the utilization of a given API at any given point. And the same for the coverage rule? Same for coverage rule. It's all actual um, client data. There is no info. Awesome. All right. Um, so, so on the same thing, you know, basically this is, you know, if your radio server is out to lunch, PSK persistent failures, DHCP failures. On the switch side, uh, the one new one we've added um, is port flapping. Right? Uh, sounds mundane. Happens, uh, you know, once in a while uh, across fifty thousand Ethernet ports on the Juniper's global corporate campus. We found seven. Right. And so um, literally you could basically say, you know, hey, you know, I want to turn off these ports. And that's the part of the self-driving. If it's a Juniper switch, we could turn off that port. And but again, you know, just because a, a port is going up and down doesn't mean it is port flapping all the time. So we actually observe that this is where, you know, you know, based statistics plus an actual model uh, helps you make an answer, um, not just looking at stats and saying, this is what is happening, because the model tells you what is normal and what is not, right? And so once you baseline, then you can take action. Uh, obviously, spanning tree loops, all of this stuff, you know, brand new, uh, uh, um, marvelous actions, um, and, and by the way, some of these are actually available on non-Juniper switches. Missing VLAN, we can detect on any, any switch, uh, you know, non-Juniper switches. Bad cable, we can detect uh, as long as there's a missed AP, whether it's a, a Cisco switch or a Juniper switch or any other switch we can detect. And of course, um, the same thing, uh, similar uh, constructs here for Juniper SRXs, and um, uh, for the van side, uh, you know, bad cable, you know, negotiation mismatch, 
bad van uplinks, all this kind of stuff. You know, we can we can act and and you know align um, the algorithms to to do this. To Wes's point, the first thing you have to do is reliably detect what is happening and then you can take you know either automated action or um, a driver assisted action 